Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here for worship at Orchard Community Church this morning. Special welcome to you if you're joining us online. Welcome to you on the patio and here in the worship building. It's a privilege to worship together, and we're so glad to be, uh, to be together as the family of the church on this Palm Sunday. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at Orchard. Well, as I mentioned, this is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday marks the last week of the season of Lent and the beginning of Holy Week, sometimes called Passion Week, that leads up to Easter. It was on Palm Sunday that Jesus entered Jerusalem with cheering and crowds waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna. So watch this and we'll get started. So Please stand as we open our service singing Hosanna. i 
digital bulletin for this service on the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, you can also, if you're joining us online, cl uh, move to the top of the stream. There should be a button there. You push that and you'll find this bulletin. Um, there's a place online to sign in and leave a prayer request. And if you're here in person, there's this handy little card that you can pull off. 
sign in and let us know that you were here and uh, maybe leave us a prayer request. We'd love to be praying for you this week if there's something that you would like to share with us. Another uh, way of prayer that uh, we've been observing during the season of Lent is our prayer wall up against the west wing. Uh, if you feel led, you can go over there and write a prayer and you can uh, put it up on the wall and just uh, offer it to God in that way. You can face it in. If it's private, you can face it out. If it's a prayer that you'd like others to see, to read, and to pray as well. So some opportunities that are coming up soon to make a difference in our world. Um, just knowing that during the season of Lent, we are involved in significant sacrifice with our mission partner, Life Water. It's an opportunity for us to make some small sacrifices of different uh, things during Lent and to give that money to Life Water, who brings clean water and the gospel to uh, regions around our world that don't have those. Um, our, our offerings this year are bringing clean water and the gospel to Bens the Bensa region of Ethiopia. Coming up in May is going to be an opportunity to give to Kitchen Collection, and there'll be um, a, a list of those things coming soon. Um, there's going to be a work day on August 20... Uh, August. That's a real advance notice. <laughs> April 29th at the Arch to sort some uh, donations there from 10 to 12. And uh, you can uh, contact Judy Alexander if you're interested in being a part of that. Coming up uh, in the life of the church here as we uh, walk through Lent, this Thursday at 7 p.m. we're going to have our uh, Maundy Thursday service. We invite you to join us for communion and we'll trace the last hours of Jesus' life. Orchard also participates in the community Good Friday service at the River Community Church at 12 o'clock on Friday, and join us again next Sunday at 10 o'clock, 1030 uh, for Easter and the celebration of the resurrection to be followed by an egg hunt for the kids. We'd love for you to be here. We do take a special offering on Easter. We try to do a special offering around the important seasons as a reminder to ourselves that our celebration is never just about us and our faith, but is also about a faith that Jesus calls us to that's meant to make a different in the, difference in the world. So on Easter, we're going to collect the special Easter offering. Half of it's going to go to a local mission um, to buy bunk beds and mattresses um, for the city center, and the other half is going to go to God's Hidden Treasures and to Ramazan Archon's church in Antalya, Turkey for uh, earthquake relief, so make a difference locally and around the world. So I just commend those things to you. want to invite Melinda forward with our kids' message today. I need some helpers to come up and help me with my message. Come on up. So today is Palm Sunday. We celebrate a very special day in kids' ministry that means donuts. You guys ready for donuts? <laughs> but I am up here with some time travelers who were back in the real Bible times, and they were there when Jesus came into town riding on a Tesla donkey. Thank you. Donkey. And the people were so excited because they had heard things about him. So I want to ask some of these people, what have you heard about Jesus? Who was this guy? Um, he turned water into wine. Turned water into wine. Now that's a fun guy. What else did we hear? He healed a blind man. He healed a blind man. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. He healed a paralyzed man. He did. That's, oh, I could not do that. That's amazing. Jesus walked on water. He walked on water. This is a really fun guy, I think. Oh, my goodness. Did you want to say something? No. <laughs> Moral support. Anyway, we also want to shout... A big word that starts with H, because that's what the people were shouting. Close to hallelujah. Yeah, what was that word again? Hosanna. Can you all help us? Hosanna. And that means please save us, right? We need some help down here. All right, children, we're going to go that way, and we're going to have stories about Jesus and donuts. All right. the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire the whole earth shakes the whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy washing over all our sins the peace of 
to be raised with Christ. I depend on you. I depend on you. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. I'm the branch, and you are the vine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. Be my strength, my song in the night. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. I am yours forever, you're mine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. Draw me close. Well, just as it still is today, in Jesus' time, the celebration of Passover was the celebration of one of the highest holy days in, in Judaism. During Passover, the city of Jerusalem would have been brimming with religious fervor. The population of the city would have exploded from something like 30,000 to over 300,000 people as pilgrims from all over the world flooded into Jerusalem again for the celebration of Passover. And for the Jewish people, Passover wasn't just a religious celebration. It was also really the celebration of their liberation from Egypt, the story of the Exodus, that story that was really central to the identity of the Jewish people and to the Jewish nation. Now, on top of that, during the time of Jesus, many Jews also used Passover as an opportunity an opportunity to express their great longing for freedom, freedom from the Romans who now occupied their nation. And it's easy to see why Passover um, was a, a, an opportunity for them to do this because it was the celebration of God freeing Israel from a foreign oppressor. And because of that, there had been a number of bloody revolts that had taken place in the recent history um, of Passover at that time. So it was for this very reason that every year just before Passover, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of the region, he left his palace in Caesarea, which was located on the coast, uh, and it was the capital city of the region. He left his, his palace and he traveled uh, 60 miles west to Jerusalem. And on the Sunday before pa uh, Passover, he would process into Jerusalem. And he would process into Jerusalem leading um, a column of Roman soldiers and cavalry with horses and armor and banners. And it was a show of imperial force. And it was meant to uh, send a message to the Jewish people that any kind of rebellion would be dealt with brutally. But it was also a show of imperial theology because Roman theology said that the emperors were not simply rulers, but gods. And this had begun with Caesar Augustus, who was emperor when Jesus was born. He called himself the son of God. He had people call him Lord and Savior, and he was hailed as the one who brought peace on earth. And all of the Roman emperors who followed him um, were considered divine as well, including Tiberius, who was reigning at the time of Jesus' ministry. But on that very same day, a week before Passover, on the opposite side of the city, on the east side, Jesus entered Jerusalem, proclaiming God's kingdom in a very, very different way. Now, our passage for today is the story of Jesus processing into Jerusalem on that day, marking the beginning of the last week of his life. And from this story and the contrast of these two processions of Pilate on the west and of Jesus on the east, we can learn a lot about Jesus and about ourselves as we begin the last week of Lent and the preparation for Easter. 
Now, this morning we are continuing on in our series of messages called Different. It's our series for Lent, and as we've talked about, it, it focuses on the fact that Jesus calls us to a very different way of living and being um, in this world and in this life, one that's often just completely the opposite of the values and the wisdom of our world and of our own human nature. And yet, this is actually a part of what makes the way of Jesus so powerful, so life-changing, because it's Jesus calling us to a completely different way of life. So during Lent, we've been looking at the most counter, some of the most counterintuitive teachings of Jesus, some of the most countercultural teachings of Jesus that make the way of Jesus so different. So far, we've seen that contrary to the wisdom of the world and our own human nature, Jesus calls us to a different way, to realize that it's what's inside of us that matters most and what God wants most. To realize that God calls us to love everyone, even our enemies. To understand that true greatness comes from humility, sacrifice, and service. To the call to putting God before every other thing and to repay the evil that may be visited upon our lives, not with evil, but with blessing and with forgiveness. So today, we're going to focus on how the wisdom of our world and our own human nature often tells us that heroes, that saviors come in power to conquer, to rule. And yet Jesus came in a very different way. He came in peace to win our hearts. So pray with me. Let's pray. Loving God, we pray that you'd speak to us today about Jesus and the person he was, the way he came, and what it is that he desires to accomplish in our hearts, in our lives. He calls us uh, in peace, and he calls us to peace with God. So speak with power, Lord, um, to us about these things this day, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be looking at Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. It's the story, again, of Passover, of the day that Jesus processed into Jerusalem a week before um, the Passover. So Luke 19, 28, uh, you can follow along on the screens, or if you've got your Bible or Bible app open, it says this. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany, he came to a hill called the Mount of Olives. And he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And he went along. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near uh, the place where the roads goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So says Jesus and so says Luke in our passage for this morning. So over the course of Jesus' ministry, <clears throat> a key question that kept coming up again and again was, is Jesus the Messiah? 
Is Jesus the one who hundreds of years before the prophets had said God would one day send? Because the prophets said that God would one day send a special person who would renew the faith of the people. This, this person would, initi- would, would deliver the people, would initiate God's kingdom here uh, in, in this world. And so now with verse 28, as Jesus and the disciples head up to Jerusalem, the capital city, the place where the temple was located, the center of religious fervor in Israel, as they head to this place during the Passover, it seems like maybe Jesus is finally going to answer that question that has been on so many people's minds. And you see in Luke, uh, the author in, in verse 29, he begins to tell us how Jesus answers that question. In verse 29, he says that Jesus came along the road from Bethpage to Bethany from the Mount of Olives in the east. Now, that might not stand out to us. Most of us are not super conversant with the geography of the Holy Land and what those things meant. But hundreds of years before this, the prophet Zechariah had spoken of that day when the Messiah would come. And he said that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem from the east along this road. So it becomes clear right away that Jesus has intentionally chosen this route. In fact, the Mount of Olives was so associated with the Messiah that there's a massive graveyard to this day located on one side of the Mount of Olives because of the legend that when the Messiah appeared, the dead would be raised to life. So for Jesus to come this way was to make a statement about who he was. He was proclaiming to the world that he was indeed the Messiah. Now, when they arrive at the Mount of Olives, uh, Jesus sends the two disciples ahead of them, and he instructs them to go to the next village, and there they're going to find the, uh, the colt of a donkey that's never been ridden. And he tells them, well, if anybody questions you, just say the Lord needs it. And, and we, we figure that Jesus was well known enough at that time that, that that would be all you'd need to say. And apparently Jesus was well known because that's all they did need to say, and they secure this donkey. And we might think, Really? A donkey? That's the way you want to make your arrival, Jesus, on a donkey? I mean, do you know anything about donkeys? They're not the most impressive animals, are they? They're kind of short and stubby. They're sort of known for being um, uh, belligerent and, and, uh, and difficult. And yet that's the way that Jesus wants to... Uh, arrive on the scene in Jerusalem. It's not the most impressive animal. We might wonder, why not a war horse? Why not a chariot? Why not something just a little bit cooler than a donkey? But Jesus did this too intentionally because this too is to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Messiah was to enter Jerusalem from the east and riding on a donkey. So Jesus was again proclaiming to the world that he was indeed the Messiah, that he was a king, and that it was he and not Caesar who was the Lord and Savior of this world. World. Now, oftentimes when people refer to Zechariah, and they often do on Palm Sunday, they refer to just the sections I've mentioned so far, Zechariah 9 9, which mentions coming from the east and the donkey, because that helps us understand what's going on on Palm Sunday. But let's read what the next verse says. Verse 10, verse 9 10, Zechariah says this He says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He, that's the Messiah, he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. So, did you catch that? Zechariah says that the Messiah will come and proclaim 
peace. In fact, the symbolism of riding on a donkey is just that. It's peace. Jewish kings, when they went to battle, they rode horses. But when they came in peace, they rode on donkeys. And so that's the whole symbolism there. So Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem affirms that he's the Messiah, that he's a king. But in great contrast to Pontius Pilate, who is processing in the under end of the city, the way that Jesus did so proclaimed that he was not just humble, but that he came in peace. And that it was he and not Caesar who could bring true peace in this world. Now, that probably sounds pretty good to us, right? We kind of like peace. But something that we really need to understand was that this is not what the Jews were hoping for at all. They were not looking at all for a Messiah who would bring, bring peace. In fact, they wanted just the opposite. They wanted a Messiah who would make war. They wanted a Messiah who would repel the Romans from their country and restore the glory of Israel as they had known it back in the day of King David. The, the Psalms of Solomon is a group of poems that was written in the first century, and it's styled after the, the Psalms of the Bible. And in the Psalms of Solomon, you hear really the Jewish desire for what the Messiah would be at that time. Because the Psalm of Solomon says things like this. It says, God will raise up a king who will shatter the unrighteous rulers, who will cleanse Jerusalem, and will destroy the lawless Gentiles. That is what the Jewish people were looking for in a Messiah. So even though the prophets spoke about a Messiah who came in peace, and even though Jesus clearly presented himself as just that, as coming in peace, that part of the message was just somehow lost on the people that day, as we'll see. Now, in verses 32 through 34, the, as we talked about, the two disciples, they go ahead, they, they go to the next village, they find the donkey, just as Jesus had said it would be. And in verse 35, they put their cloaks on this donkey, kind of a makeshift saddle. They help Jesus aboard, and Jesus begins to ride the donkey toward Jerusalem. And as he does, people begin to put their cloaks out on the road. Um, it says in verse 36, and this was kind of an ancient version of the red car carpet treatment, right? They put their cloaks out on the road. The Gospel of John tells us that they cut palm branches, and they spread these palm branches on the road as well, and they began waving them in the air um, as Jesus uh, came along. Um, and the crowd had been following. Jesus began to grow. People began to line the roads, joining the celebration from the literally thousands of pilgrims who were heading into Jerusalem that day for Passover. Now, when we think of the palms today, on Palm Sunday, when we are, when we are waving these things around, they seem to us like symbols of, of love. They seem to us like symbols of peace. They seem to us like symbols of Jesus as our Savior, because that is what they rightly mean to us today. But that's not what they meant to the Jewish people on that day. You see, the palms were symbols of Jewish nationalism, and they were an expression of the people's desire for freedom. When did you wave palms in ancient Jer uh, uh, Israel? You waved them for victorious generals and conquering kings. And they were waving them for Jesus because that is what they wanted Jesus to be, a military leader, a political leader, a conquering king. That's what they were looking for. They wanted a conquering Messiah, not a peaceful one. And we can understand that because the wisdom of this world in our own human nature is that heroes and saviors are powerful. They have big giant muscles. They often carry guns and ride war horses or other powerful things. They don't come in humility and peace riding on goofy little donkeys. That's not what heroes and saviors look like according to our world and according to our nature. But as Jesus made his way down the road from the Mount of Olives, the crowds 
they began to joyfully praise God in a loud voice because they were thinking that Jesus was going to be who they wanted him to be. Uh, they began to shout, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, in verse, verse 38, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the other gospels tell us that they shouted, Hosanna, which means save us now. It means Messiah, save us now. That's what you've come to do. The people could see that by fulfilling the prophecies of Zechariah, Jesus was proclaiming that he was the Messiah. But even as they praised God, it was clear that they had kind of the wrong idea about Jesus. What they wanted was war with the Romans, and any peace that Jesus might bring in their minds would only come after the battles had been hopefully one, and the Romans had been expelled from their nations. And in all of this, we have to reckon with an incredible irony in this moment. Because on that same day, both Pilate and Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. Pilate from the west and Jesus from the east. And on that day, they greeted Pilate with disdain. They hated him. He was the the sign of Roman oppression. And here came Jesus from the east, and they loved him, the sign in their minds of their possible freedom. But in less than a week, they would reject Jesus. And one of the main reasons that they would reject Jesus in the end was that he did not look enough like Pontius Pilate. Because as they praised God, um, it, it, it was clear that every, although Pilate was every, represented everything they hated, in reality, he was much more like the Messiah they wanted. If you had taken Jesus and you had put him on Pilate's war horse leading that group of soldiers, he would have been everything that they wanted. They would have been ecstatic. But Jesus was a different kind of Messiah than they wanted. Now with verse 39, we find a kind of interesting interlude. The, the, the Pharisees, some of the Jewish leaders of the time, they come up to Jesus and they're upset. They're upset about all this excitement over Jesus. First of all, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. So they felt like all of the cheering that the people do, was doing was blasphemy. But really, probably the bigger issue was that they were seeing Jesus' popularity. And now they were worried that maybe he had finally risen to such a level that he could challenge their authority. So they tell Jesus, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus refuses and he says that if they were to keep quiet, the stones would cry out. Isn't that an awesome saying? We all think it's awesome and have no idea what it means, right? None. <laughs> I know, I know. The prophet Habakkuk, actually, had prophesied judgment against Judah just before Jerusalem had fallen 5,000 years ago, 500 years before to the Babylonians. And what he said was, the stones of the walls will cry out concerning the sins of of the people. And he was symbolically saying that, that 500 years before that Jerusalem had turned its back on God and that the stones would cry out in testimony of that and that they would be, the Babylonians would come in and to destroy things. So um, what Jesus meant today, meant his words had a double meaning. On the one hand, he meant that the people's praises of him, they couldn't be stifled. They were just too great. But at the same time, what he meant was that um, the stones of the wall and the words of the people, ironically, were going to bear witness to the fact that the city was going to soon reject Jesus. This is, that's what's going to happen, ironically. And that's the reason that when Jesus approaches the city in verse 41, he weeps because he knows what's going to happen. Jesus weeps because the city doesn't recognize that he had come to bring peace and because they didn't want peace. Do you know what Jerusalem means? It means city of peace. But the people didn't know what would bring them true peace. The city of peace was blind to Jesus, the Son of God, who incidentally is also known as the Prince of Peace. Despite their praises of the people at that moment, 
Shortly, they were going to reject Jesus and seal their own fate. Verses 43 through 44, Jesus tells the future of what will happen. He tells of how in just a few short years, the Romans will come, as they do in 70 AD, surround the city and destroy it um, with a siege. So Jesus was a different kind of Messiah than the people expected. And the problem was that they had focused their hopes for the Messiah on a very, very worldly view, on what the, what the wisdom of this world says heroes and saviors look like. And in their mind, that was someone who came with power to conquer. And so they misunderstood. They thought the deliverance that the prophet said that the Messiah would bring would be deliverance from Rome, not deliverance from the trap of sin that we all fall into. And they thought the kingdom that Jesus would come to bring would be restoring the glory of the nation Israel, not initiating God's spiritual kingdom here in this world. And so, they stumbled. And we're no different. Our world and our own nature tell us that heroes and saviors come with might and with power, not riding on donkeys proclaiming peace. But what they and what we often fail to see is that there are some things in this life that just can't be accomplished. There are some battles in this world that just can't be won by force. You see, God's great desire is that we would love him. And real love can't be forced. God could have made us love him, but that wouldn't have been real. That would have been some kind of a sham. So instead, God sent Jesus in peace to win our hearts so that we would willingly give them to him and in doing so, bring us peace with God. I want us to look at our second scripture for today. It's just one verse from Romans. It talks about this very subject. Romans 5, 1 says this. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the hard and the sad truth about us is that we do wrong. We're not just. We're guilty of sin, sin that causes real damage in this world, damage to other people, damage to our own selves. But Jesus brings grace, grace that forgives our sin and wipes away our guilt so that we are just, so that we are justified once again in God's eyes, just like that verse says. And all we have to do to receive that grace and to be just once again is to believe. And if we do that, it says in Romans 5.1 that we will have peace with God. Jesus came in peace to bring us peace with God. But you might ask, well, okay, well, what exactly does that mean? What is peace with God? Well, the word that Paul uses here is ernon from the verb ario, and it literally means to bind together that which has been broken or separated. So the kind of peace that Paul, the author here, is talking about is fixing something that's been broken. Paul is saying God loves us and made us to be at peace with him, but our sin has shattered that peace, broken that relationship. So now we live often feeling distant and alienated from God and very unpeaceful because of that. So the peace that Paul is talking about here is a peace that brings us home, back into the closeness with God that we were made for. And it comes through Jesus. That's why he says that it comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, prison warden Kenyon J. Scudder tells of a friend riding on a train years and years ago next to an 
a very troubled and anxious young man. And the boy finally blurted out that he was a convict on his way home from prison. The crime that he had committed had caused his family great, great shame um, because although they were poor, they were proud. And they'd never visited him in all the years that he'd been away. And he hoped this, because, he hoped this was because they were too poor to make the trip such a long distance and too uneducated to write, but he couldn't be sure why they hadn't come. So the young man went on to explain that what he had done was he wanted to make it easy for them. So he had written them and asked them to put up a signal that when the train passed a little far, uh, a little um, farmhouse on the outskirts of town where they lived, if they had forgiven him and wanted him to return home, they were to put white, a white ribbon on the apple tree near the tracks. And if they didn't want him to return, they were to do nothing. He would see that there was no ribbon and he would just stay on that train and ride it to the end of the line and make a new life for himself somewhere else. But as he neared his hometown, uh, the, the suspense became unbearable to the point where, where he couldn't even look up and he just buried his hands, his head in his hands. And this, this friend offered to watch for him and they changed places um, in the train so that he could sit by the window. And a few minutes later, this man, he puts his hand on this young convicted man's shoulder and he whispers, it's all right. The whole tree is white with ribbons. And you know what? In the very same way, God is calling you and me home. He's calling you and me back to the things that we were made for. To be known and loved by him. To be close and to be at peace with God. You see, the amazing thing is that God did not respond to our sin with anger or rejection, which is what we'd expect. Instead, God responded by sending Jesus in peace to win our hearts and to bring us peace. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus came and lived this life. He lived your life. He lived my life. He lived the good and right life that we are supposed to live and we don't. And then he took that good and right life and he offered it to God on the cross in place of our flawed and broken lives. And when he did that, he brought us grace. Grace that puts right the wrong of our sin. Grace that wipes the slate clean. Grace that makes us just and right before God and brings us peace with God. And all you have to do for that to be a reality in your life is believe it. Is believe that God loves you that much. And if you do, then Jesus, the Prince of Peace, has indeed won your heart. Which is exactly why he came to be the Messiah. Amen. Friends, we're going to receive communion in just a minute or two. So I want to invite you to, <clears throat> to quiet your heart and your mind. It's an opportunity to give over anything that might get in the way, to seek forgiveness or maybe to forgive someone else. Just take a prayerful moment or two to do that. Friends, this is the Lord's table. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, invites everyone and anyone who puts their faith in him to come to this table and to share in this meal. And let us not be confused. Jesus invites us to come right here, right now, whatever the state of our lives. He does not call us to wait until we've gotten our lives together because that may never happen. He calls us to come because at this table we find 
the grace of God and the power of God that will help us to become the people he's called us to be. So the invitation is for each of us to come, to eat, to share in this meal, to leave here today as changed people. Will you pray with me? Let us pray. Loving God, it is with joy and thankfulness that we praise you. Because we know that you created us and love us. We know that it's you who gifts us so greatly and seeks after us. And that even when we sin, you forgive us and seek after us. We pray for your forgiveness, that you would fill us with your grace. We are grateful. We pray for our world. We pray for peace to the war in Ukraine and for all the other places where violence reigns. In our own nation, Lord, as we enter into another election cycle, we pray that you would help us to be people committed to kindness and civility. We pray for our community, Lord, for our friends and family and neighbors, that you would cover them with your love and protection. We pray especially for those among us who are sick, who are mourning, who are in all kinds of pain, who experience, Lord, depression and anxiety and loneliness and stress and alienation, Lord. We pray that you would bring healing and peace and use us to help and to minister wherever we're able. Lord, we thank you for this church, that it's a place where we're encouraged in faith, supported in spiritual growth, and challenged to serve. So we lift all these prayers to you, our God, O God, by the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread of the Passover meal and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, broken, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup of the Passover meal and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul tells us that whenever we eat this bread, whenever we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. As you receive communion, you'll come up um, the aisles. You can um, hold out your hand. They'll hand you a piece of the bread. You can then take a small cup of the uh, juice, receive your communion, and return to your seat. Uh, we will have three stations in the middle with the a typical communion. There'll be a self-serve station with the prepackaged over to the right, and there will be uh, gluten-free over to the left. Would the servers please come forward? I invite you to come. God created us exactly how he wanted us, and he knows who we are. Sometimes we think less of ourselves, but God never does. I 
has ransomed me, His gracious arms in His And while I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free. service there's going to be some folks over in the west wing who'd be ready to pray with you or for you about anything that might be on your heart i encourage you to do that um, this day and as we go forth from this place let us remember that as opposed to the images of the world we have a great hero from heaven jesus who came in peace to bring us peace with god in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen <laughs>